Thank you for inviting me here today. I am delighted to be able to address you, and um, especially on the subject, my most favourite subject on diversity and inclusion. But before I start, I thought I'd give you a little bit of a view of the industry. And I don't know if you follow him, but Elon Musk recently said, if you go back a few hundred years, what we take for granted today would seem like magic. Being able to talk to people over long distances, transmit images, flying, accessing vast amounts of data and making sense of them, all of these things would have been considered magic. And that's not to mention the robots. So in order to make that happen, though, we absolutely need roomfuls of magicians. And I don't know about you, but we need lots of them to support the pace of digital adoption and demand. And this is why digital skills are crucial for this country. And at the pace that technology is moving, we are having to skill up people for jobs that do not yet exist. And perhaps more pressing, we need to prepare for a future that is already here. Personally, I love technology because, for me, it's a great equaliser. It doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, what resources you have access to. Technology represents an immense opportunity, as long as you've got the skills and as long as we don't leave anybody behind. We can let our imaginations run completely wild with technology. But to make sure that we navigate this technological opportunity, we have to make sure that we've got the digital skills available. And we are in a position where we have to educate our educators to prepare whole new generations for jobs, as I said, that don't exist. And I don't know if you know this new group of, of young people. They're the centennials. These are the kids born in 19... Uh, sorry, where am I? They're 21, so they're born in 1996, right? Yeah, that's right. Born in 1996. And these are the kids who are brand disloyal, completely brand disloyal. They care less about pensions, more about the coffee you're serving. They care much more about purpose, why the company exists. Um, they have a phone or a device permanently glued to their ears, and we are going to have to adapt to them. Not only you know, do we have to think about what we're skilling them up for in terms of jobs, but we have to make a change in terms of how we lead and how we manage groups of kids like that. Kids, I say, 21-year-olds, and they're, they're adult, you know, almost too, too young to be that smart, but they're really smart. An impossible task, perhaps, but when you look at the UK, we have a leading digital economy. This country attracts twice as much investment in technology than any other European country. It's huge. The technology industry, just on its own, and that doesn't mean counting any other sectors, is 12.5% of GDP. It's huge. That's two and a half times the, the size of the car industry. So the opportunity is enormous. It's a thriving opportunity, thriving engine for us to drive this country forward. And as chair of digital leaders and president of Tech UK, I can see lots of companies from the very large to the very small. And what I see is that the UK's digital economy is currently creating jobs at nearly three times the rate of the rest of the economy. Three times the rate. So demand far outstrips supply, and we are simply going to end up in a position where we will find that, I'm going to use a bit of a metaphor here, which I don't really want you to tweet about because it would be a bit unfair, but think about Ryanair, who cancelled how many flights recently? More and more and more. Why? Not enough pilots. And I'm telling you, the tech industry is going to metaphorically run out of pilots if we don't start training more. So just think about that as we need to create more traction, be more open 
to people joining our industry. And that means also from a Brexit perspective, please don't close the borders um, to the Department for Exiting the EU because we do need also to import talent. Our industry has, has literally thrived because we have huge amounts of innovation ideas and great talent coming from overseas and this country has always been very open to that but that's my only reference to Brexit today. You can tweet about that. <laughs> um, so, and, and, and by the way, a third of the talent that's in the UK comes from EU countries, so it is important to invite our near neighbours to join the effort to continue the momentum for this amazing industry. So what about the women then? It's not just about migration policy or international data flows. The most critical area for me is encouraging more women into the industry, like the women here in the audience, like the speaker lineup, diversity and inclusion are really important issues to me personally, and I am passionate about it. I've spent a lot of time advocating for women, and we still remain significantly underrepresented in this industry. It is now 23% of the technology industry, of which 17% are in IT. So we've made some progress. But as Nick said, it's not representative of the market. It's crazy. You look at, a, you look at a, an example like gaming. It's not banking, but gaming. 50% of gamers are female. And yet less than 7% of women make up the development side of the gaming industry. So who's creating what for whom? Just saying. Uh, it's an opportunity. So we have an urgent skills gap and we must turn to the women. So, you know, I guess in, in the ways of um, historical terms, we probably say we need to dig for victory at this point and that will only make sense to people who have a little bit of um, a life behind them, she says, the, us older ones in the room. <laughs> But I want to be very clear, this is not a plea for diversity's sake. I am not an angry feminist and I do not spend my time raging against the machine. However, what I will say is that from a productivity perspective, one woman on the board of a business can reduce the risk of bankruptcy by 20%. And that percentage increases the more women you have on the team. So we should all look at diversity and inclusion in terms of business benefit and productivity as much as diversity of thought as well. Because diversity of thought is really compelling and very important to have around the boardroom table. The technology industry that I entered 30 years ago was very male dominated and they said to me in 1999, Jacqueline, we simply don't put women on the leadership team. And you know what? There was a miracle there. And the miracle was, at least they told me. Because actually, I could have been there another five years, and I really would have been pissed off at that point. <laughs> so actually, what happened, though, was that I spent my early career emulating what the men did. And I was that scary boss lady. I'm going to fess up. I metaphorically ate razor blades for breakfast. I was a terrifying alpha female. And to be honest, it did work to a certain point. It did. And I would describe it as being pretty successful to a management level. It didn't take me to leadership level, actually, but it took me to management level. And where it also took me to personally was that I was incredibly unfulfilled. And, and I realized I was always going to be disappointed. And I was always going to be disappointed because I was, you know, angry feminist, raging against the machine, not because I was a woman in a man's world, but I was a woman trying to be a, a man in a man's world. And that was never going to fly. So my own self-limiting belief at that time actually was that you had to be a man to make it. And that, I came to realize, is simply not true. The problem then in tech and tech-related jobs um, is that we have a chronic, chronic, chronic shortage of STEM um, encouragement into our industry. And we have got to boost that domestic talent pipeline for digital skills. 
And there has been a concerted effort. There is an effort to change the curriculum so that we've got an option to choose digital subjects. But it's not like Wales where it's embedded and it's across all subjects. And I just think we could do better on the curriculum side. But we are doing some interesting things. There's been a budget announcement for lifelong learning. And at the pace that we are moving in technology, we will all have to be accountable for our own personal learning journey. And we will have to continue um, our educational journey, not just coming out of university or, or further education or apprenticeships, but we will have to do it as we, as we move further along our careers, because otherwise we just won't keep up. And that will be important as we continue to work longer and live longer. So this is our moment to consider diversity and inclusion as a way of solving the skills gap. I've been working with the Girl Guides recently, and I don't know if you know this, there are 400,000 of them in this country. It's huge, right? And just to give you an idea of how we need to step up to the plate, I walked into a village hall to do the first badge that we're creating with Tech UK. And this badge, I thought, will do about consent, because consent online is pretty important to little people. I walk into the hall, ask the girls to fire up their smartphones. I, I realise they're not allowed to have smartphones in the guides, but anyway, that was another thing. Um, and then I realise there is no broadband. What do you do with that? I mean, seriously, this country is so poorly served in terms of infrastructure. And so that's another one of my jobs, is to poke the government in the eye on things like that. But I'm just saying, you know, if we really are serious about domestic talent pipelines, We've got to do better at beating on the door of number 10 about things like that, because that's absolutely rubbish. You could tweet that. <laughs> <laughs> Quite apart from the kids, there are 11.8 people, 11.8 uh, million people in this country registered with disabilities, whether we can see them or not see them. That is one in five people. And by the way, 50% of those, talking about wheelchairs in Nick's introduction, 50% of those are mobility constrained. And if we can do nothing else in this technology industry, we are really great at flexible working, right? In terms of technically, we can make it work. Culturally, we have to make sure that leadership is open to flexible working. We've got new ways of measuring and being comfortable with people who are working remotely. Um, and frankly, I personally believe that great <coughs> ideas go to die in a boardroom and probably thrive in a coffee shop. So, you know, flexible working, hashtag that all the way. <laughs> Geographic exclusion is also an opportunity, but again, that goes back to broadband infrastructure. We need people not just in cities. I was at a, at a meeting earlier this week where one of the centennials, the 21-year-old, said, I don't know why everyone moans about broadband, because it's fine. How much, how much do you need? Like, yeah, but that's because you're in London, <laughs> right? So there are other places that don't have it, and that also is a, an opportunity to completely swell the workforce um, if we are geographically inclusive. Neurodiversity is also a very important opportunity for us. So um, people on the Asperger's, autism scale, again, really great in cyber. We've only got 10% of women in cyber, which is really low. And we should do more about that. And neurodiversity is a really great way to do that. I was at GCHQ doing um, a diversity talk, and they all marched in their core cyber team, very secret group, and they were all pale, male, and stale, in a good way. And, and I said, OK, let's talk about diversity. And of course, one man put his hand up and said, but we are diverse here. And I said, well, what makes you diverse? They were all of the same age, so they really needed an injection. Next. They were all going to die off at the same time. Um, and he said, 90% of us are either on the Asperger's or the autism scale. So that's great, but <laughs> diversity in all its forms is a good thing. So of course, women remain significantly underrepresented, and we need to do more about that. Um, women make up 47% of the wider British labour market. So in technology, it simply isn't good enough to be at 23% and then lower in other niche areas. Do I also need to say that there's still a, 
a startling 9% pay gap between men and women in UK tech. It's the largest gap in the world's leading digital econ economies, and we've really got to do better at that. We will struggle to get gender equality in senior positions if we aren't getting the pay right across our businesses. Simple, it's a fact. And it must be a priority for industry to drive equality and lessen the gender diversity and inclusion gaps within our sector. Whatever happens, we must not lose our place as a digital nation of significance. We've done so well so far. And if we lose our advantage, it will be because we run out of talent. And let's face it, technology talent is the currency of the future. We've seen it already. There is wage inflation. People are moving from company to company. The next generation is brand disloyal. So whatever you do, they're going to move anyway. So we have to think about how we are, are comfortable with people staying with us for two years and then moving on. That's just life. That is what's going to happen. Think about flexible working, thinking about the gig economy. Um, so we are going to have to adapt as much as anything else. But let me give you a few stats about women in technology. So fewer than one in 10 women are in leadership positions. And that says it all, because fish rots from the head down, just saying. 65% um, of the UK's mixed secondary schools have no girls doing computing A-levels, none. Many have no girls doing any STEM subjects in the sixth form, and almost 2 million women in the UK are currently economically inactive due to caring commitments. 70% of them would like to come back. So return as programs all the way. Really need to think about that. Even worse, a recent Centrica survey on teacher pupil STEM perception, 29% of the male teachers believe that STEM careers are more for boys than for girls. 16% uh, of female teachers thought the same. 29% of female teachers said they weren't at all confident in their understanding of STEM careers. Um, and 44% of pupils, 44% of pupils said they could not think of any female role models in STEM. That's pretty depressing, isn't it, from a school perspective? And that right there is why it's our opportunity to inspire the next generation. So my old netball teacher used to say, if you can touch it, you can catch it. That's, that's quite tough, isn't it? Um, but she was right. And I believe that if you can see it, you can be it. And that's why role models matter. And in a group of, of women this big, I, my challenge to you is, who can you nominate? for an acknowledgement award next year inside the technology industry. Because each one of you could come away with an award of some significance because you've been nominated by someone. It could be Rising Star, it could be Leader of the Year, it could be you know, for your generosity in terms of what you've done for the STEM industry or, or inspirational role model. It could be any one of those things, and, and I know that it's hard to nominate yourself because it feels like self-congratulation, it feels not very British, but actually you could nominate someone else. Um, and I would say take that away, play the inspiration game. It takes less than 30 seconds to inspire someone, by the way. Um, and I would just say nominate someone and, and be in that, um, in, that, in that inspiration game, that generosity game. Our behaviours are copied, so you are a role model whether you like it or not, by the way. So if you, if you do bad stuff, then you know, you're going to create bad karma, and vice versa. <laughs> um, I've got the one minute warning, so I'm just going to um, finish here on... Um, I walked into Mother Care the other day, and I saw two t-shirts. Under age eight, blue t-shirt for boys, said on it, genius. Great, good motivation. The t-shirt next to it was the girls' t-shirt, also age eight. Now, I grant you, it was not pink, it was yellow, so big tick for that. Um, but what it said was, make the world a prettier place. 
Now, we control mother care if you like, but that's not necessarily where I'm going to go with this. Where I'm going to go with this is, if you stop buying it, they will stop selling it. So we have a responsibility, a massive responsibility, to program the next generation in the way that we want them to grow up. And I would just make a plea here, which is, you know, there's lots of messages in my speech around be the inspirational role model, create an opportunity for, for uh, inclusion in your businesses, but also it starts much, much younger than that. And I would just encourage you all as ambassadors for the planet to create some neutrality and your way of giving back can also be to program the next generation in a good way. So hashtag mother care, don't troll them. I would, I would just say, think about what you can do because I can tell you this for nothing. The cavalry are not coming. There is no big thing um, coming to save us from the diversity and inclusion issue. It starts with us and it finishes with us and it's all about what you're going to do to make a difference and it's our chance to be either a bystander or a participant. I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much.